behalf of Region 7 and the Ask for Respect Supplemental Grant, we want to welcome you to our series of interviews focusing on the perils and pearls of lessons learned regarding COVID-19. Our hope is to share the lessons our colleagues have learned and to assist you with your healthcare journey during this pandemic. Thank you for listening. Thank you everyone for uh, joining us today for this conversation on back to school and COVID. I guess this is our 2021 edition of that conversation. So uh, thank you to our esteemed group for, for joining together for this conversation. So my name is John Lowe. I'm with the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, and I serve as Assistant Vice Chancellor for Health Security and have had the opportunity to work with a number of, of you. Um, so really excited to have this conversation about schools and kids this year. Um, if we could just have each of you give us a brief introduction on who you are and what you do, I think that would be great for everyone that listens. Uh, Gwen, could you go ahead and uh, give us your background? Sure, I'm Gwen Scar. I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician that practices both at UNMC and Children's Hospital in Omaha. And I'm also a member of the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit team. I'm uh, Carrie Neiman. I am also uh, an infectious disease doc at Children's and UNMC. I see both uh, adult and pediatric patients. And then I also serve as a medical advisor to Douglas County Health Department, um, but coming today as more um, an expert in infectious disease and as a parent of someone who is in school. Um, and I'm Ann O'Keefe. I'm uh, a, a physician and my specialty is public health and preventive medicine. And I'm the senior epidemiologist at the Douglas County Health Department. So hi, my name is Justin Frederick and I am uh, an epidemiologist uh, with the Douglas County Health Department. And um, I am here today as uh, again, infectious disease epi and uh, a parent of two school age kids. Well, perfect. We've got such a great mix of kind of the frontline clinical perspective and the, the public health uh, intervention and epidemiological perspective. So it should be a, a great conversation. So uh, Dr. Scar, maybe starting with you and, and rolling through the group again, like we did uh, with introductions. Um, so we've done this before, right? We went through the 2020, 2021 school year and now we're initiating the 2021, 2022 school year. Um, from your perspective, how did things go last year? And are there any, any factors this year that you're thinking, wow, this is, this is different? Um, sure. So last year, certainly when we started out the school year, there was kind of a mix of modalities of how people were going to school, whether that was in person with masks required, or whether that was a combination of in-person and at home, or some kids elected to do all school at home last year. Um, I think overall, in some ways that went really well. Um, in some ways that was really hard for a lot of kids from sort of a you know, friend's perspective and a mental health perspective, especially for those kids that didn't get to interact with other kids throughout the school year. Um, this school year, um, certainly we know that um, the Pfizer vaccine is available to anyone 12 and older and certainly FDA approved for those 16 and older, which is very exciting for us. Um, wishing that our younger patients could get vaccinated as well. And this year it seems um, as though kind of, again, the modalities have changed a little bit. Um, seems as though more schools are doing full in-person school um, and then some sort of different masking requirements with different districts. Yeah, so last year, I think we did a really good job of putting um, processes in place to keep kids safe at school. And the biggest thing there was that when kids were attending school, they were masked. Um, and so we go forward now to this school year and we definitely want all of our kids in school because we know that's the best place for them for so many different reasons. Um, but when we compare last year to this year, I would say looking at our community, maybe COVID's a little bit worse right now. We have this new variant um, that 
appears to be more infectious um, and may have more severity to disease. And yet we are bringing kids back to the school room and masks aren't consistent. And so we, we did a wonderful job last year of showing that we can keep kids safe in school with masks. Um, but now um, I feel like we, we gotta just say, you know, we did a great job, but we gotta do it again. Um, exactly. I, I think the added challenge is that it's just been going on for a long time and people are getting very tired, um, but the virus isn't getting tired. It's still, you know, coming at us from new directions. So I think it's, you know, it's a really big communication challenge for us to try to, um, you know, just try to encourage people to stick with it for a while longer. And uh, I agree with everybody. Last year was a, a real challenge, uh, especially for our school age children and having two kids of my own, not being able to socialize and be in the classroom where the real learning takes place. Um, if I were to compare last year to what we're seeing so far this year, I would say that we have evidence of transmission amongst our youth uh, more so than we did prior to the Delta variant. And we've had uh, several large clusters and outbreaks that we've identified and uh, we're seeing transmission in classrooms now, which is concerning. Um, and I, I think I'll end there. Oh, thanks for that, uh, Justin. And, you know, we covered a lot of ground there. Um, you know, many of you mentioned the Delta variant. And so uh, maybe for our two clinical providers, is there anything unique or different that you're observing in either pediatric or adult populations on a, a clinical side of things with respect to this, this Delta variant? Sure. So we know that Delta is more transmissible, so it's easier to share person to person. Um, and so far, it seems as though sort of with this round with Delta circulating in the community, that kids are getting sick more often than they were, um, you know, at this time last year and kind of with the peak that we had in the late fall and winter. So we've in the last um, over the last two weeks, certainly seen an increase in pediatric hospital admissions. Um, so we're, we're seeing kids starting to get admitted and be very sick and require ventilators. Yeah, I would say, you know, up until this point, we would have kids in the hospital, you know, maybe once a week, once every two weeks, and really there was a, a lull in the summertime, but now it's every day that patients are coming in and we're getting new patients almost every day. And it's, we're having to start thinking about, um, you know, different therapies um, that, you know, mainly the adults have had to use up until this point, but we're using them now in pediatric patients. And of course, with pediatrics, we have a lot less data on using these um, therapies. And with kids, there's sort of that added um, worry or risk of after the acute infection, getting the multi-system inflammatory syndrome. So with kids, you know, the acute infection is worrisome, but then certainly four to six weeks later, um, there could be additional effects that could have them come back into the hospital and make them seriously ill. And those kids do tend to be ill. Um, over half of them are requiring PICU admission, um, or ICU level care, sorry. No, thank you for that. Uh, for the non-clinician, uh, breaking down the clinical acronyms is helpful for me. So Dr. O'Keefe and Justin, maybe from the public health perspective, the epidemiological perspective, are there any majorly different trends that you've noticed with Delta, with this Delta emergence that's occurred over the last uh, month and a half summer versus what you saw last year? Um, I think what was different about last year is we, we really weren't seeing clusters and outbreaks in uh, schools or, or pediatric populations. And maybe that was because we had de-densified the schools and everybody had masks on and we were doing a better job of social, social distancing. But we did start noticing some clustering when we started to first see the B117 or the UK variant. But since then, with the, with the Delta variant, um, we've had outbreaks, large outbreaks amongst pediatric cases or, or patients. 
And um, we've actually been able to go back and look at those genetically and, and link them together. So we have, uh, I would say, strong evidence that transmission is occurring in, in these settings. Uh, two in particular were these uh, a day camp and an overnight camp that we were looking into. So I guess my concern right now is uh, we're seeing more transmission amongst this group. I think it, uh, the zero to 19 and then uh, 20 to 29 year olds make up a really large portion of our total cases right now. And um, so it's concerning, uh, I would say. And Dr. O'Keefe, anything to add from your perspective? Yeah, I, th I think that the fact that such a high proportion of our cases are, are now in the younger age groups, um, you know, over 30% are under, um, under the age of 19. So um, it's, it's affecting kids uh, a lot more this year. Yeah, so, and maybe this is a question for any takers, um, you know, with kind of a, an increase in transmission and the number of cases, and as you just articulated, the expansion in the, the share of those cases in, in the, our, our pediatric and, and child populations, what would you, group of experts, say are, are some of the important prevention measures that can be taken uh, in large part, recognizing what you just said about the, we now recognize the value of in-person education uh, in a variety of ways. Um, so what would you say based off of your experiences are really important things to prioritize in, in the classroom and maybe even in the school to try to, uh, you know, sustain in-person education, but keep disease transmission at, at a low level? Masks. Masks are number one. Um, we know they're effective. There have been a number of studies. Um, there have been a couple of nice um, MMWRs or morbidity and mortality weekly reports that have shown the benefit of those um, kind of across school districts in Georgia, as well as a um, sort of epi investigation of a teacher in California who was COVID positive and was only wearing her mask sometime. Um, and definitely we know masks work. I think all the other things that we were doing last year are part of it. Um, we always talk about the Swiss cheese model and how we need to um, do multiple layers to try to keep that virus from being uh, transmitted. And so in uh, addition to masks, you know, the, the frequent hand washing, um, the trying to, to cohort the, the kids um, a little bit um, so that we are not uh, taking that from classroom to classroom, um, trying to maintain some distance between the kids when we do have to take the mask off, um, and then trying to ensure that our buildings have the best ventilation as possible, although sometimes that's just uh, limited by the, the age of the building. Excellent. So I know we've got a lot of parents in the group today. So uh, can you elaborate on, so we've identified masks as, as a, a key intervention. Um, what type of masks are you looking for to put your kids in? I would say any mask that they will wear right. is, is the best one. And so if it's got, for, for my kid, he loves cloth masks. He doesn't like the paper ones I got him. Um, and he likes the ones that have like um, a tiger on the face. So animals. Yeah, any mask that fits and is, is comfortable enough for them to not, you know, to wear it consistently all day, I think is key. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's, it's constantly um, reminding him how, how to wear the mask, that the mask needs to go over his nose. And so we work on that a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point, and it's one that's kind of straightforward in occupational health, right? Adherence is really the first step, and then we can always fine-tune things after that, but the most impactful step is it adhering to kind of the, the precautions that we know are impactful. Um, that's a, a really salient point. So um, maybe you could also help us, in case we have a lot of teachers and, and parents that listen, um, are there any sentinel symptoms that are predominant or really helpful to be watching for, especially as we're in the, the times of, of Delta variant. Um, 
Is there anything that would be kind of a, a cautionary sign for a parent to maybe think we should we should reach out to a, a clinician or we should keep a child home today? I would suggest having a high suspicion, right? So it's better to stay home, get tested. Um, if you are having any symptoms, so things like fever, runny nose, cough, sore throat, um, high index of suspicion, staying home that day, making sure that we're getting tested um, and know that you're negative before you return to the classroom. Oh, that's great. So uh, also along those same lines, our kids are back to school, they're interacting with their, with their friends. Any recommendations that you all have for how we can accommodate our social interactions of children outside of school? So are there certain environments that are safer than others or that should be prioritized as opposed to other environments? I, I would say play outside. I think that's good in a pandemic or not in a pandemic. Um, but where you've got the increased uh, ventilation um, would probably be the, the best location. And it's kind of a time where we all have to get a little bit creative about how um, kids can meet up and play. So certainly outdoor activities, you know, riding bikes and um, kind of a safe area or safe space. As we come into winter, it's going to be a little harder to be creative about activities, um, especially with younger kids. But, um, you know, if they're older, they can do zooms with their friends and you might need a parent to facilitate that and maybe you know drawing contests or just again kind of having to think outside of the box to make it fun for them and to you know make them actually want to be on that zoom and interact with each other yeah absolutely so what what about the landscape of vaccines so um of course in in at the end of last school year, we had a, a handful of vaccines approved for that, uh, the 12 and over. Um, where are we at in terms of, uh, do we have vaccine that are no longer in emergency use authorization status and that are now formally approved? And for what age groups uh, does that exist? So yes, there is one vaccine that is approved for uh, kids 12 and up. The other vaccines are, are approved for 18 and up. So we do have only one, but there's plenty of it around. Um, and we've been trying to um, make that as available as possible by, you know, actually going into schools, having mobile clinics, um, just kind of every way we can think of to help, help make it easier for parents to get their kids vaccinated. And just a note that in just recently, um, we in Douglas County just went over 50% of kids 12 to 17 are now fully vaccinated in Douglas County. So that's, that's really good news. And we're just going to keep working at it. Oh, that's great. So I know that with a lot of the back to school vaccinations and immunizations that we get for our kids on a normal year, that we really try to shoot to have about 95% of a population vaccinated. Do we know what kind of the target level of the percent of our community need to be vaccinated that will really start to, to provide a lot of protection for our communities and our schools to where we can start getting away from some of these preventative measures? I think that is a, it's hard to know what that number is. I think there are just too many factors involved. Um, I think we need to try to keep working at it until we see the case numbers go down. I, I just don't think there is a magic number and it's hard to, hard to tell people that, but, <laughs> but every virus is different and the populations are different and that all you know, is part of what the magical number for humid, uh, herd, herd immunity is for a specific virus. Yeah, absolutely. It's safe to say it's not 50%. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Just checking there. Maybe, uh, you know, I think for our public health colleagues, this was just an area of interest. Um, so you guys have been at it in terms of doing exposure assessment and contact tracing with respect to schools for over a year now. Are there any best practices or some really crucial and key steps that you would recommend that, that school leadership consider implementing in, in terms of 
identifying a case and then helping work with their public health partners or maybe working through on their own kind of exposures and, and uh, quarantine. So I have to say that schools uh, have been great partners in uh, the COVID response. It's challenging as, as uh, COVID continues. Uh, we're a good year and a half into this and there's a lot of fatigue that has set in and, and we know that we want kids in, in the classroom. So um, the best thing for parents to do is to notify their schools if their child tests positive. Uh, at that point, the school does report it to public health and then uh, we work with them in trying to determine the best way to proceed forward, whether that's uh, through contact tracing and identifying those at highest risk and doing some form of uh, uh, maybe we ask the classroom to put masks on and continue to monitor closely if we have additional cases. Uh, if we identify a cluster of cases, perhaps we need to close that classroom temporarily, um, kind of as a reset uh, so that we can stop transmission within the school setting. But it's difficult. Right now, I, I would say that we're struggling with how to proceed forward best um, with our school partners in mitigating cases of COVID. Uh, and I think that's just because there's not a lot of guidance out there for how to do that well. And um, unfortunately, uh, you know, that's, the, that's where we are right now. And I hope that parents understand that as we learn more about COVID, as we learn more about Delta variant, those recommendations may change and um, to hang with us. Yeah, so we're, it, it seems like we're constantly learning more about the virus. And I saw a local physician on social media last week saying um, it was something to the effect of, we're not, we're not changing the rules on the virus, the, the virus is changing. And, and so we're, we're trying to keep up. And I, I thought that was a really salient point, especially as we're talking about Delta, a word that really wasn't in the COVID vernacular this time last year, right? Um, so I, I think along those lines, you know, I've, I've heard you loud and clear on prevention measures uh, in terms of, of masks being a priority and then the other layered interventions. So if, if we're getting a lot of questions from parents in different parts of, of the country and in our particular region, really trying to ascertain, you know, should I be considering pulling my kids out of in-person school? Um, can I predict when a school might go to a hybrid schedule or, or remote learning fully? So in, in your experience and in your respective expertise, um, are there any good sources of information that you would recommend parents trying to keep track and, and make informed decisions or to see what might be coming? Uh, where would they seek out those, those types of information in, in your perspective? Um, but I think one thing to do is to try to keep track of what's going on in your community and the local health departments will help um, give you an idea of, of how much disease transmission is in the community because that's going to affect the, you know, the safety of the school. Um, and, and as far as what the school is doing, they, they um, probably have a lot more things to consider um, in, in whether they can uh, take these measures or not. So I think maybe just... Um, try to find out from your school what, you know, what kind of plans they have. Just kind of echoing what Dr. O'Keefe said, I think paying attention to transmission in your community is extremely important. In addition to that, a lot of schools are posting, or at least at the district level, even the, the school uh, building level, uh, the number of cases that have occurred, you know, daily or weekly. And that's a good way of, to, to keep track of kind of what's happening there. And locally, I know that we're really uh, asking the schools or um, recommending that the schools notify parents each time that there's an exposure in the classroom so that and the parents can make informed decisions about how best to move forward, whether it's they're going to keep their child home or at least they know maybe they shouldn't visit grandma or grandpa for the next 14 days. Um, and I, I think that's extremely important as well. Yeah, that was a, a really great point. So also another question we've been hearing, and, and there seems to be a lot of information out there about this. So we've got a lot of teachers that are vaccinated. We've got a lot of students that are vaccinated. Can, can people who are vaccinated infect other people if they're infected with COVID? It's possible. Um, certainly being vaccinated um, decreases your risk of getting the virus and getting sick and 
probably to some extent transmitting that to someone else, but it is still possible. I saw I saw firm nods right away. I thought that was going to be a short answer. So thank you, Dr. Scar. So what what would you say are some of the more important points to educate our kids on related to COVID and COVID safety? And we'll just acknowledge that I think we've we have panelists and conversationalists on this call today that we have the full spectrum of age kids, right? So all the way down from kindergarten to to senior and maybe young adult, but from, from your perspectives, I mean, you guys are living and breathing clinical management, public health management. What are you, what are the things that you think are really important for children to know and understand um, about COVID or about intervention measures or, or anything else that's kind of going on as a result of COVID these days? So the fun thing about pediatrics is there are so many developmental levels, right? So how you explain COVID to Dr. Neiman's um, kindergartner is going to be different than how you explain that to a high schooler. But really just explaining that there are germs or a virus, again, depending on their level, that can make you sick and that there are some important things that we should do to keep ourselves healthy and keep our friends and family healthy. Yep. So when I speak with my son, we just, we talk that there, there's a germ out there um, and it can cause people to be sick. And if he gets it, he, he may not be terribly sick. I don't want to scare him, um, but we want to make sure that we don't pass that on to our friends or to our other family members. And I think with that level of caution, he seems to be doing okay. I agree. I, I have a middle schooler and I, you know, it's a good opportunity to, to maybe, um, talk about science and it's, you know, kind of a good educational moment. Um, although, you know, parents don't really know anything at that age from the kid's perspective. So sometimes the conversations are short, but I think, you know, just anytime you can kind of throw something in to a conversation, I think they hear it, even though they try to brush you off, you know, just keep talking to them. They, they absorb a lot. Yeah, my kid sees it as a story. He's like, mom, tell me the story of how COVID came here. We go, okay, well, back in 2019 in Wuhan. <laughs> okay, mom, thanks. <laughs> I, uh, I have an 11-year-old and a 13-year-old, and I think that uh, what's worked really well for us is being good role models. And um, if we want our kids to wear masks while they're at school, you know, they see us wearing a mask when we run to the grocery store or they see us washing our hands after we do something and, and remaining calm. I have two kids with anxiety and a little bit of germophobia. I, I don't know where that came from, but um, you know, I, remaining calm and, and just making sure that they understand the reason and not instilling fear um, really helps. Yeah. That, you know, that's a great point. And I, I've got a kindergartner and a senior. And so, you know, I, I'm reminded that, it, it wasn't that long ago that we really started in teaching our kids cough etiquette, right? As we nav as we would navigate kind of flu season and, and cough etiquette became a thing. And we figured out to, to cough into kind of your inner elbow instead of your hand and, and the kids got that. Um, and we've kind of taken similar approaches with the kindergarten on mask etiquette, right? So observing that if not taught otherwise, children and, and even adults have this tendency to like pull down your mask so other people can hear you really clearly and just you you know kind of walking through that i think the other that that you the point that you all made is that information is really power and help dissuade fear right um we we tend to make errors in judgment and and run into all sorts of consequences when we're making fear-driven uh decisions and so the, the only example I have of that is this is with my senior, older, very different level of communication going on there. But, you know, back this spring when the trends in, in Nebraska were declining, but we still had a decent amount of community transmission, my senior wanted to go bowling, right? And it was like, Dad, should I go bowling? Is it safe? And for those of us that live and breathe COVID, of course, I had like 50 questions that I wanted to navigate with him. And I finally just let go and was like, you know what, how about you go there? And you look and see, are there a lot of people there? Are they abiding by distancing and masks? And then you make the decision. And I w it was a proud moment as a parent where about 15 minutes later, I got a call and he was like, yeah, well, not going bowling. Um, so, but really working through that, it wasn't that he ran away from the bowling alley in fear or that we dissuaded him from going at the get-go, but kind of armed him with, 
here's, here's the things that we look for. So along those lines, we just talked through, oh my gosh, uh, education, uh, information is power over fear. The question for each of you, and that is, we're also hearing that a lot of parents and teachers and school administrators are dealing with kind of decision fatigue, uh, burnout. It's been a really long, uh, in, in some cases, a lot of unknowns, in other cases, a lot of contentiousness that they're navigating. Um, so maybe for each of you personally, one, how are you doing after this long year of your infectious disease, pediatric and public health journeys? And, and what are important things that parents and teachers and, and school administrators should be thinking about doing to maintain sanity um, and maybe uh, stave off burnout if that's possible? Well, I, I think I, everyone else will agree. I think we're all very, very tired. Um, it's been a rough year and a half, or maybe it's been more than that now. Um, so I, I think just we just have to try to take care of ourselves as much as we can. Um, it's still important work, though, you know, so we, we keep working hard. I, uh, we'll do the public health perspective, and then we'll let our, uh, our docs talk. Uh, but I would say that this has probably been the roughest year and a half of my life. I mean, literally, it's exhausting, and it's uh, something that we can't escape as uh, public health practitioners, as as healthcare uh, practitioners as well. It it follows us. It, it's in our in our career. It's at, you know at work all day, and then we go home, and it's on the news, and we hang out with our friends and family, and that's all they want to talk about. And you know, so it's uh, I would say fatigue is definitely set in. Um, trying to not let burnout set in, but that's hard. So I would just say, you know, to, to the parents out there that are listening to this, the school administrators and things, um, it's tough, you know, but uh, we have to stay the course because if we don't, um, I, I fear that we'll look at, we'll be looking uh, like some of these other states where their hospitals are full, their, their children's hospitals are full and things. And so for our community, for our neighbors, we, we need to continue to stay the course uh, understanding that nobody's enjoying this. I'll echo that um, the healthcare professionals are also over COVID. <laughs> um, we didn't know about this virus, you know, a year and a half, year and three quarters ago. And since that time, just the amount of uh, literature that has come out regarding this virus, um, it's, it's constantly changing and trying to keep up with it all it can be um, quite difficult. Um, I would stress to our uh, parents and superintendents that when we make recommendations or suggestions, we are trying to do it on the most up-to-date information that we have. We're not, we're not making it up. We're trying to use science um, uh, to guide us forward because we haven't been here before. Um, and try, try to keep the political out of it um, and, and go on the science. I would absolutely echo all of that. We're, we're tired. I'm tired of wearing a mask. I don't like it. I don't want to, but I know that I need to. And sort of all of the noise and contentiousness um, sort of adds an extra layer of fatigue to us as well. Um, and I think everyone in the medical field and in public health, we, we really have your best interests at heart and we have your kids' best interests at heart. Um, we want them to grow up to be, you know, healthy, well-adjusted adults. Um, and we kind of have to keep pushing here and keep doing the right things. No, thank you so much for that. So uh, maybe, maybe one last question, and that is, you know, every year we hear kind of the, the public health campaign or the messaging campaign, get a flu shot. Uh, this year, do we get a flu shot? Should our kids get a flu shot this year? Absolutely. Yes. All right. So we got unanimous head nodding. I, you know, so that this has been a, a really great conversation from my point of view. I, I think that uh, as much as it's the pandemic has been really difficult for parents that have had really clear decision fatigue, right? Do we have a play date? Do we not have a play date? Do you go, go with this group of kids to this event or not? Um, I think it's just been really remarkable to see the commitment of teachers and educators and staff in schools 
really continue to to prioritize at first it was kind of remote learning and then it was hybrid learning and now it's doing everything they can to become infection preventionists so that they can protect in-person learning so i think along those lines i really want to thank each of you on the call for the role that you play in putting out really trusted information not only to help teachers and schools and parents make the best decisions for our kids um, but also when we come to you and we have a case or we have a sick kid that we need managed or we have an outbreak in a school that needs to be managed i, I just don't think i can do it justice to say it with words that uh, your tireless efforts to keep our communities and our kids safe are very much appreciative and just thank you so much for what you do and uh, please 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 continue to take care of yourselves uh, because you play such an important role in the health and wellness of uh, our most vulnerable um, and our entire community. So thank you so much for joining us today uh, on this edition of Back to School 2021, uh, the COVID edition. Uh, thank you so much for that conversation. It was amazing. Thanks, everyone. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thank you.